Hello and welcome to the History Hour podcast from the BBC World Service with me, Max Pearson, the past brought to life by those who were there. This week, from a 100 years ago, a plot to overthrow the British in India. Plus, we'll meet the woman who first managed to hand-rear African elephants orphaned by poachers. We know them almost as well as our, our own children and we love them equally. And Hal Prince, the man behind the musical that dared to be different. What good is The whole trajectory of the show was completely unprecedented. Everybody said, what in hell is amusing about Nazis? Life is a cabaret, old chum. Come to the cabaret. That's all to come. But first, the years immediately after the Second World War were characterised by huge changes and evolving, sometimes hardening, attitudes. The tectonic plates of competing ideologies were shifting, an iron curtain between East and West appeared. In the midst of these global tensions, individuals and groups of people could find their lives turned upside down by powerful forces beyond their control. That's what happened to one group of key workers in France in 1948. They were coal miners who found their wages and conditions cut in the post-war austerity, and they went on strike. But as this report from Lisa Louis reveals, they were crushed by a government fearing the influence of creeping communism. We had become the pariahs of the Republic. They were regarding us as terrorists, although the government was actually terrorizing us. Norbert Gilmez was one of the strikers at the pit in bully les mines in northern France. Now 95 and still living locally, he remembers how, until the strike, coal miners were considered heroes, helping France struggle back onto its feet after the devastation of the Second World War. Les hommes, ce sont les mineurs. These miners are giving their all. In 1919, it took five years to make up for the losses after the war. In 1945, it only takes two years. 90% of French industry was running on coal. The miner was the country's most popular worker. He was celebrated and seen as a patriot. Those of us who were working down the mines were badly equipped. We just had cloth shoes with holes in them and pickaxes to dig with. But we were enthusiastic about our job. We rolled up our sleeves and got to work to give the country back its coal. But the miners' enthusiasm soon soured. In 1948, the government started to strip away what they considered to be well-earned rights. Their minimum wage was abolished, slashing their pay by up to 80%. A second controversial measure concerned occupational diseases. The strike started with a ballot. It was very democratic. 94% of us took part. 90% voted in favour. It was an all-out strike. However, the government was determined not to give in. It sent riot police and the army to confront the miners. As the French coal strike enters its fourth week and industries become crippled by lack of coal, troops and police take over pits in the northern basin. The riot police kept beating us. Many of us were arrested, often at home, and sent to the prison of Bethune. They mainly arrested union members. Six strikers were killed. The police were ruthless. Gilmez helped organize the walkout at his mine. As an office worker, he arranged for the distribution of clothes to the miners' families and to have their children evacuated to other places for safety. As a punishment, the authorities targeted Gilmez's family. While I was away, they searched our house. My wife was on her own with our son. She was pregnant. They pushed her against the wall and grabbed her by the throat. They said, we will kill your husband if we catch him. She was terrified. Faced with this overwhelming force, the miners lost. By the end of November, all industrial action was over. 3,000 strikers were arrested nationwide. Many received prison sentences, even though it was not illegal to strike. Gilmez was convicted for impeding the proper functioning of the mines. 
I was sentenced for something that was technically impossible. They said two colleagues and I had told some railway workers to bring a coal train back into the mine instead of taking it to the coking plant. It's true that the rail workers had asked three of us for advice, but we said we didn't have the power to tell them what to do. You know, that verdict just didn't make sense. Gilmez spent 15 days in prison and he was sacked, just like the other 3,000 arrested strikers. But that wasn't the end of the state's revenge. After their release, the miners found themselves blacklisted. We were searching for work everywhere. However, it was really difficult. I finally got a job as a road worker. But only half an hour after I had started work, they came up to me and said, the mining corporation doesn't want us to employ you. You have to go. All the private companies in the region were dependent on the state-owned mines. It was like a state within a state in France. Gilmès finally found work as a journalist on a communist newspaper. It meant a daily commute by bus of several hours. His sacked former colleagues were facing similar situations. They struggled to find jobs, and most of them eventually had to move far away to make a living. Even many of those who kept their jobs faced retribution. My comrade Léon Léglise had the incurable lung disease, silicosis. But when he was diagnosed, the doctors told him to work above ground. Then, after the strike, the bosses sent him back underground, where he would breathe in that poisonous dust. Little by little, he could feel himself die. For me, this was torture and state terrorism. But why was the French government so intent on punishing the mining communities? After World War II, the tensions between the Soviet Union and the West had begun almost immediately. In 1947, the communists had been forced out of France's coalition government. In 1948, Soviet-backed communists had staged a coup in what was then Czechoslovakia. Most of the French miners were communists. For Jules Mock, interior minister at the time, the union leadership was pursuing a hidden agenda. The miners themselves are fighting for better working conditions and higher salaries. But the Communist Party intends to get back into power. The leaders of the strike want to reproduce what happened in Prague just a few months ago. They want to stage a coup. Gilmez himself was and still is a communist, but he denies that there was a communist plot. The government has invented this myth. It was never our plan to stage a revolution. The only issues in the ballot for the strike were our demands to keep our rights. Let me give you an example. At one point, we managed to turn the tables and capture 200 riot police. You know what we did with their weapons? We destroyed them and threw them in the river. Do you really think we would have done that if we had been planning a revolution? But it was the beginning of the Cold War. Can you understand that the government might fear a communist plot was behind the strike? I do understand what you mean. But you know, there is a saying in French. When someone wants to kill his dog, he will say the dog is blind. If you want to crack down on people, you will find a reason. There had been another strike in 1947 when the miners were asking for more meat and bread. The government had given in. That's why they felt that in 1948 they had to crack down on the miners. The French government has gone some way to acknowledging that the miners were treated unjustly. 16 of them received 30,000 euros each as compensation for their unfair dismissal. In September 2016, President François Hollande honoured several miners who had lost their military grades as a consequence of the strike. Il y a des causes qui, uh, valent que sacrifie beaucoup. There are causes which are worth a lot of effort, even if they happened a long time ago, and now only a few people are still concerned by this. Making up for one injustice is like setting the world in order. But Gilmès says it's not nearly enough. Almost 70 years on, his fury hasn't dimmed. He says the government destroyed the strikers' lives and should reimburse them for their lost careers. I think everybody should have the right to live happily, and I still believe in justice. If the government doesn't pay me and my wife, then my children can continue the fight. 
France's last coal mine closed in 2004. Lisa Louis with that report.